My name is Michael Brand. I'm director of the J. Paul Getty Museum. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this very special program this evening in conjunction with our exhibition, Jim Dine, Poet Singing, The Flowering Sheets. This evening, it's my special pleasure to introduce um, a conversation between the artist Jim Dine and Vincent Katz on the creative process behind Poet Singing, The Flowering Sheets. Jim Dine is one of the most dynamic Oh, I think I've hit the touchpad now, sorry. This is not a, not a good technology evening for me. Um, Jim Dine is one of the most dynamic and influ influential voices in American art over the last 40 years. He first came to prominence in the early 1960s in New York as a kind of artful provocateur. Alongside artists like Alan Capro, Lucas Samaras, Red Grooms, and Claes Oldenburg, Jim staged some of the first happenings and created work that would help define a burgeoning pop art movement. Since his first solo exhibition in 1960, his paintings, sculptures, photography, and prints have been the subject of over 220 monographic exhibitions worldwide. He is an artist whose habit of returning again and again to certain iconic images, a bathrobe, tools, the symbol of a heart, belies an essential restlessness with the materials of art. Through the course of his career, he has experimented not only with painting and sculpture, but also drawing, performance, installation, photography, printmaking, artist books, and most significantly, poetry. Throughout his career, Jim Dine has also had what he calls a great romance with the ancient world, whether that be Latin poetry, the Venus de Milo, or the ancient Greek and Roman, or the ancient Greek and Roman sculpture of the Munich Glyptotech where he completed several important drawing projects in the early 1990s. For all these reasons, Jim, I believe, is the perfect artist for the first contemporary art project at the Getty Villa. Inspired by sculpture in the Villa's collection of antiquities, Jim has created an installation for our own times, bringing to the Villa his own distinctive voice in a mixture of sculpture, drawing, and poetry. He has demonstrated the persistence of antiquity and the continued importance ancient art and culture have on artists today. Working with him has been a huge privilege and a pleasure for our staff, and we are all delighted with the results of our collaboration. And remember, 220 monographic exhibitions, and yet when you go up and see the installation here, it is clearly a really exciting, fresh piece of creation. This evening, we have the very special opportunity to hear Jim Dine talk about his Villa project in conversation with Vincent Katz. Vincent is a poet, translator, art critic, and curator with a deep interest in contemporary art. He is the author of nine books of poetry and won the 2005 National Translation Award for his translation from the Latin of the complete elegies of Sextus Propertius. His work in the field of contemporary art ranges from critical essays and book uh, collaborations with artists to curating exhibitions, and making documentary films. Vincent is the editor of the poetry and arts journal Vanitas and of Libellum Books. So please join with me in welcoming Jim Dine and Vincent Katz. Hear me? Good. Well, um, it's, it's a real honor and a thrill for me to be here, and I'd like to thank the director and also the curator, Reiner Mack, for inviting me. Um, I was thinking about a title for our conversation, but I didn't really come up with one, but I did want to read one line of poetry from the installation, poet singing, that I think could serve as a guide to some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. And that line is, this is a line from Jim Dine's poem. My awesome power lies beneath the cuteness of geometry, which I think has a, shows a sense of humor, but also um, gets at something that I'd like to discuss with Jim Dine tonight, which is 
this play between the exterior and the interior, what, what we see when we see, when we look at a work of art, and what Jim Dine sees, which I think is something deeper, perhaps. Um, well, it's different. Anyway. <laughs> it may not be deeper. OK. Well, <laughs> He will, he will be able to elucidate that better than I. Um, but I did want to, I would like to back up in a minute and go back to some of the antecedents to this exhibition in the sense of um, Jim Dine's earlier work with antiquities, works of Jim Dine's based on antiquities. Um, but just to say before that, and then, then we'll come back and discuss, of course, the, the installation upstairs, the poet singing. Um, but I did want to say that it's, I think it's a really unique installation and one that is very ambitious and aggressive in a sense, too. It really, I mean, there's that, the big head that's a self-portrait that you can't avoid, and also, you know, great pains were taken to make you aware of the poetry. Poetry is sometimes included in art collaborations as almost a decoration or a, an addendum to something more important or thought of as more important. But here it's really central, and um, that's something that, that we'll get to in the later part of our discussion. Going back in time a little bit, I'm just going to list a few things that you've done earlier, and then you jump in whenever you want to give more detail, or I'll, I'll ask you questions too. But so, actually, the 40 drawings that, that Jim Dine made at the Glyptotech Museum of Antiquities in Munich in 19, were done in 1987 and 88, but that was not the beginning of his interest in antiquities. In, in 1978, he did a work called A Large Drawing of a Small Statue, which is actually an Egyptian model, an Egyptian artwork that it was based on. And then, I think importantly, um, what I'd like to ask you about this, a study of a Roman copy of a Hellenistic statue found in, in Caesarea in 1979. Would you, would you care to tell us how, that, how you came it, to well, I was in, piece? Um, I was in Jerusalem for the summer uh, printing, and also one of my sons wa is an oboist and was a student oboist in Israel at that time, so I wanted to be with him, and it was just a piece I saw in the uh, Israel Museum, and I drew it, and, but my interest in, an, in the antique comes from, I, I was the, I was, the son of a woman who was very interested in culture. And in our town, in Cincinnati, where I was born, we had a fairly decent small collection of antiquities in the museum. And so she was always schlepping me there. And I was continually inspired for some reason. And then when I was 12, I went to a public high school based on the Boston Latin School. So we went for six years, and I was a very poor student and dyslexic, and I shouldn't have been. The only reason I got there was because I was smart, and I passed, passed the test. But after that, it was a nightmare for me for six years. But I took with me my, even though there was a failure in Latin and in behavior and everything else, <laughs> I took with me a romance about the so-called ancient world. And... When I began to really draw seriously, that was in my uh, 40s, I thought, besides drawing from life, from models, which I drew from every day, and I lived in the country in Vermont, I, I thought I would like to draw from Greek and Roman sculpture. And I didn't know how to begin, so that was one of the pieces, that the way I began. Um, I, fortuitously, I came to Munich to see some paintings. Be Go ahead. Before we get to the Glyptotech, I wanted to mention the, the two pieces that are on the screen, which What's are actually... What's the date? 
Sorry? What's the date? That's uh, 1986. Yeah. They, I, I was sent a bulletin from the uh, Metropolitan Museum, and in the bulletin was a little uh, sculpture, a bronze sculpture of a rap dancer. And I photographed, I went to the museum and photographed it, and then I drew these, and I enlarged it. Uh, these are these are like five or six feet tall. So I already had a sense of wanting to make it on a modern scale, you know. Um, and you had done work based on the Venus de Milo sculpture as well. Yeah, and still do. I'm still involved with Venus, uh, but I, <laughs> for sure. And uh, but I always but in with with the Venus de Milo. I, to make it mine, I also, I also was involved with it because of my involvement in <clears throat> Spanish still life painting, 17th century, when, or Memento Mori from Dutch still life, and, and I wanted to feel like a real artist. So I bought a um, plaster cast this big and knocked the head off and, tried to, and carved on it a little bit and tried to make it mine, and then drew from that. And so when I got to Munich, to I went there to see Poussin in, at the Alta Pinecotec, and I, I must have gone to the wrong place because I, I got to the Glyptotech. I didn't know what it was, and I just I couldn't believe it, the beauty of it and the beauty of the collection and the way it was displayed in this spare way. Well, they also had little stools, like this is it, and... You see, it was built by Mad uh, Ludwig and in a Baroque way with Rococo and things, and Allied bombers took the whole thing out, and it took 30 years after the war to restore it. But they restored it in a minimal way so that we could see the sculpture better. And against the walls were little, little chairs, folding chairs that, that archaeologists and artists and art students could take and draw or meditate on the sculpture. So I started that. I'm not good in those situations and people were looking over my shoulder, not because I was an artist of some note, but because they're looking over everybody's shoulder and they're getting rid of your privacy. So I went, I was living in Venice that winter and I just, I, I just bought a lot of postcards and went back and made my own glyptotech, which is what the, the slides of the black and white is. Yes. Um, so now these are all that. It was shown in the Glyptotech, but that was all done in Venice in my apartment. So this is actually an exhibition that you had in 1990 of two bodies of work of your drawings, which can be seen on the back right. wall, based on. And then the they were the shown in the Albertina in the, the year before that, and they were seen by a man called Klaus Wieneisel, who was the director of the Glyptotech, and he said. I don't get it. Why didn't you call me? You know, you could have you could have um, worked in the museum. I said, let's go. So he let me come in at night, and so I would work from ten at night till five in the morning. <clears throat> it was a great trusting place. One guard, one guard, some mice, and that was that. You know, and so I did that. Then I'd take these big drawings, not these, but. You'll see some others that were really big, like sometimes six feet, ten feet wide. I'd take them back to London and work on them in my studio. I was living there then. What we're seeing now are from your first... That's from the photos. Yeah. And, you, and these are, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are done on mylar and tracing paper. And drafting paper. Because you had the intention because to do I, them as Because my prints. intention was to make uh, Elio gravures. How was your... Working, you begin to tell us, but could you tell us a little bit more about how the second time you went there with the permission to work at night? And I set up large, my easel. How was that? I set up my easel and I started to draw. I put down plastic on the floor because I was concerned about screwing up the place. And I um, spent a lot of time meditating on the anonymous sculptor who made these things. It was really a way to communicate across the ages. To, to, you had a chance to say that some guy had the same intentions I did, or a group of guys did. You know, maybe, maybe there was a, a group of guys who made, we were talking about before, uh, maybe there was a master of 
of the forearm. He did that, and another guy did the folds. You know, but these people were superb. And you, as a, a, a tw 20th century artist, which I am, um, the disaffection from society is quite great. You, you know, obviously. But for these guys, the integration into the society was so fantastic that um, I think they had a chance to meditate without being frantic. Now, that could be my romance about things and my dissatisfaction with modern life, but I think that. And, and your working process on, on paper, or works on paper, can often be quite violent and quite yes. uh, aggressive, to use that word again. You sometimes cut, use tools to work on the paper. You sometimes I don't do it to, to display my aggressiveness, but because I feel it's needed. I do what's necessary to get the result I want, and often my work is quite physical because I use power tools on the paper, grinders and rotary sanders and Dremel and things, ways to erase, ways to make new kinds of marks, I think. And you, you will sometimes... Uh, uh, this is from the, the second round. You will sometimes add sheets to paper to make it larger if it Yes, right like, there, uh, yeah. at his ankle. You can see it goes up. I glued it. I, I'll do anything <laughs> to make a drawing work, you know, anything. Then, in, then you did... A, a series in um, Carlsberg. I went to, then I went to, uh, at the opening of this exhibition, a guy came up and introduced himself, and he was called Henning Johansson, and he was the curator. He was Verneisel's colleague at the Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen. <clears throat> so I went there the next year and made. Um, a drawing that's seven drawings, seven parts. One of it, that's one of the seven views of this hermaphrodite. And I sat there for a while and did that, and uh, then went back the next year to the Glyptotech. But it was by that time a little diluted. For, I mean, I, I was into other things. That's all. Well, yeah, I wanted to actually stress that point. We're, we're focusing tonight on Jim Dine's interaction with antiquities, which we're seeing has been an ongoing process. But, of course, you were working on many other kinds of work during this period at different times. And, on, I mean, and I've spent a lot of time. I live half the year in Walla Walla, Washington, where I make sculpture. And I've lived there for 26 years on and off. And so... To make sculpture at the Walla Walla Foundry, I mean, one has to spend some time. So you have to keep, keep at it. You know. Well, I wanted to ask you about, about something, which is you, you have a very expansive attitude, I would say, towards materials, towards subject matter. I mean, in terms of materials, you, you paint, you use enamel, you use oil paint, um, you draw, you pencil, charcoal, um, you make sculptures, you just said, in bronze and in wood. Uh, in later years, you got involved with photography, and poetry has been very important. And I was thinking about that and thinking about other artists, and Mirandi came to mind as somebody who's almost the, the exact opposite, somebody who just did one thing while well, he did works on paper too, but if you think of his paintings and his works on paper and very similar subject matter. And so I wanted to ask you about, about that, that quality that I would consider almost a voracious appetite for, for materials, for craft, and also for an engagement with the visual world. I... Um... To begin with, I'm glad you brought him up because he's always has been a hero. He was a hero for me, like Giacometti was a hero for me, like Dubuffet was at a certain moment, like Bacon was at a certain moment. These European guys who had a life in art. Uh, and I'd, even as an American, 
I always felt more comfortable with European art. Um, and that's not to deny where I come from, but it's just a genetic thing that I f felt that way. And I felt he particularly was <clears throat> so, uh, made such sacrifices to remain straight, uh, to remain straightforward. He had one interest, these bottles, this etching, this painting, this watercolor, basta. That was it. And I, th I thought it was admirable. On the other hand, it's not my personality. And um, I was born an artist. Not about quality, I'm not speaking about that. Uh, but I could only do one thing, that is to make art. I knew it when I was two years old. So I've never done anything else. I could never hold a job. I taught a little bit, but it was bullshit. I mean, it was like, forget it, you know. It's a waste of my time and theirs. Because all I wanted to do was make art. And it's all I could do. It's not just what I wanted to do. I, it's all I can do. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, and the, I have immense pleasure every day doing it. So every day I work. And it's sometimes embarrassing. Because other people say, geez, don't you take a vacation? I'm on a big time vacation. I got, you know, this is it. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Giacometti. I wanted to read this short quote of Giacometti's. This is from Jim Dine's catalog, exhibition catalog called Drawing from the Glyptotech, um, with a, an essay by Ruth Fine in which she quotes. This is a quote from Giacometti that I thought could be interesting in this context of what we're talking about, about especially the piece upstairs and this work from antiquity of thinking about the relationship of the contemporary artist with art from the past. So this is Giacometti said, suddenly I see myself in Rome at the Borghese Gallery copying a Rubens, one of the great discoveries of my journey. But at this very instant, I see myself simultaneously throughout my entire past at Stampa near a window in about 1914, absorbed in copying a Japanese print. I could still describe every single one of its details. And in 1915, Rembrandt's Supper. And then a Pinterickio suddenly comes to mind and all the Quattrocento frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. But then I also see myself four years later returning to my studio in Paris in the evening leafing through books and copying this or that Egyptian sculpt sculpture or a Carolingian miniature, but also Matisse's. How can one describe all that? The entire art of the past, of all periods, of all civilizations rises before my mind, becomes a simultaneous vision, as if time had become space. And I, I mean, that. Ruth, Ruth really knew what, I mean, it is applicable to the way I feel, that, um, I do similar things, you know. I'm always drawing and I'm all, and so this has been a, a, a very big part of my life. This um, trying to bring to life these antique sculptures, because when I'm drawing them, I don't think they have anything to do with, let's say, 19th or 18th century academic drawings from the academy. I think I've tried to. To bring them, that's another view of the hermaphrodite, but to bring them to life. And I think it's what the artist does. It's, it's an alchemical idea. You, you, um, you, you turn shit into gold, hopefully. Uh, it's the same story with Pinocchio. That's why my obsession with Pinocchio originally ends continually, because um, this story that uh, Collodi made about this talking stick that suddenly comes to consciousness as a boy through a long journey is really essentially what we do, what artists do. Hopefully, that's our, that's our task. Well, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with art of the past. Do you see it as one of learning as, say, an apprenticeship, so to speak, or just a way of learning from something? Or do you see it more as one of companionship, or is there a combination of those? It's a lovely idea. Elements? Companionship is a lovely idea. Because, 
You know, I went, I went for a half year once to the Boston Museum School. I was at a university at, in Athens, Ohio, in the middle to late 50s at Ohio University. And it was a kind of a school in Appalachia and, and had 4,000 students. And I couldn't go anywhere else because my grades were so bad. So, and it was cheap. I had no money. And we were Ohio residents. It was 85 bucks a semester. And I thought, I enjoyed it. But I thought, no, oh, no, this is not culture. This is not what, you know, what artists do. So I got myself admitted to the Boston Museum School for a semester. It's complete crap. It was about copying from old masters. It was about um, understanding the composition of Cezanne through some kind of geometric means. This is baloney. I mean, it's about, for me, it was always emotion. What I felt from my heart about paintings, about sculpture. And um, my interest in art before me is the same interest I have about my cousins. You know, I'm interested in family, and I'm interested in, in I'm interested in where we come from, and I'm interested in the, in the various mixtures that take place genetically. I think it's fabulous, and every once in a while you get Giacometti or Rembrandt. You know, amazing. Yeah, you've said that you were not interested in doing depictions of sculptures in the way, same way that you're not interested in doing depictions of people. Right. And you use the phrase, you, something like, you, you didn't want to do a, a sharpened pencil drawing, which you, I understood that you meant an academic right. depiction of something. So that, and then knowing a little bit about your process, it led me to think that it's almost as though you're doing a performance, an artistic, an art performance that results in a work of art in the presence of whether it be a, a sculpture or a person. Well, you mean in More the presence of myself? I don't know what you mean by the uh, performance. I mean, what I do and the way I work is quite physical. So if it was filmed, it might be amusing to see. But I don't know about the performance. What do you mean? Well, I guess I'm thinking about um, how your history in performance might enter into a discussion of your artwork in the sense that you, in, early in your career, you, you did many performances or you did performances very intensely for a period of time um, and became known for doing them and they were called happenings. Um, and then more recently, you've become interested again in performing poetry um, so I'm just interested in this idea of performance. I think that art well, is, it is a performance. It is a facet sense. of my means of expression, performing for me. I mean, like this. I, I enjoy this tremendously because I always come away learning something about myself that I can use somewhere. It's really grist for my mill. Well, before we get to talking about the installation in particular, I wanted to ask you one one other question, which is, and I think it would be interesting in the context of where we are today, which is your thoughts on experiencing art in museums. So we've talked a little bit about how you experienced work in the Glyptotech, um, first with people milling about you, looking over your shoulder, then having this very intense one-on-one -on -one experience with no one around at all, just the dark and you and the sculpture. Um, how was it when you came here to the, to the Getty? How was your experience of, of viewing art in this context? When I was asked to come and do something, I had no idea what to do. And I thought, I know what they're thinking. I mean, they, they're thinking probably because I had a history doing this and there was some books about it that maybe I would be interested in dealing with the collection that way. And that's the way I approached it. I just thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I kind of put everybody off like this, say, what are you going to do? And I say, oh, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. 
but I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just moved slowly. But so many things come into it to make what's upstairs. Um, I couldn't have made it without my experience of carving uh, Pinocchio over the last three or four years, both with my hands and with chainsaws and with this machine that points up, that enlarges. All right, we have some images from a series of many sculptures that you've done based on Pinocchio, some in wood and some in bronze. Mainly in wood. Yeah, and I wanted to show these in particular because I think they relate to the work upstairs in many ways, but partially because of the, the cracks, the, these kind of accidental marks that appear in the materials. Um, I've always taken the clue from the material and accepted what I'm given. So if you use this kind of wood and it's green, it's going to check. We call it checking. So you either live with that or you fill it with wax and clay and cast it in bronze, you know. But I like the sense of wood and that it, it's like in medieval churches. I like seeing the wormholes in um, the saint figures. Um, but none of this could have been done without the machine that's, that we use in Walla Walla. Of, and the machine is no, no, the result is no different than what Michelangelo had in Carrara or Rodin, which he called a pantograph. It's called pointing up. But this is just done by a computer and it, it sends a program in and it, it does the same thing. It, you, I give a maquette, the maquette is scanned. Three dimensional scan. Yes, and the maquette is scanned. And then it's carved by the machine, you know, and I'm there to say stop, and then it's taken off, and then I make it my own by, with a chainsaw, with chisels, with power grinders, and with paint. And all that is made possible through this machine, really, because, oh, of course we could take years and point up, but it doesn't interest me. That taking that kind of time. And because of that, I'm able, because of my restless soul and impatience, I'm able to follow the thought through and do a room like that in a year rather than 10 years. So now we get to the actual works here that inspired, in one case, and in another case served as models and inspiration for the work upstairs. Would you well, like to tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, I, 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 when I saw that, I looked around a lot, and but when I saw this guy who's either meant to be Orpheus or from the cult of Orpheus and was a poet, and I have, all my life I've been involved with singing and the idea of muses behind me and being inspired by women. When you say involved with singing, can you... Explain. I mean that as a little kid, my inspiration came from singing and drawing. Not only me singing, but the people around me singing. And the idea of words singing, too, of, of poetry and of song. And also, as I grew older and as I became more literate, I realized what it meant to have muses and what muses can do historically and not absurdly. And when I saw this piece, I thought, I want to really make a piece about my um, involvement and inspiration all these years from muses, from from how art begins, how, how you take this, this little flame and tend it, and who, how you keep it from being blown out. And I, I thought this was so poignant, uh, these two sirens' faces and this, this kind of typically pathetic male, art, male artist um, enchanted by these women. It was a kind of 
autobiographical moment for me. Um, and I had had a history all my life of being inspired by women to make art. I mean, they didn't tell me to do it, but the process was there. I understood it viscerally in my fingers, what it meant to be enchanted. And just that. That's what I, 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 I saw it and I thought, I want to make a piece that's about that, amongst other things. I mean, this piece isn't just about that, but it's about other things that one can't talk about, that are not verbal. I mean, it's not that they're taboo. Well, this, this uh, group can be seen upstairs, and these are large terracotta sculptures um, from the south of Italy, from the 300s BC. Uh, but interestingly, you took these as inspiration, as you've been describing, but there are two other much smaller pieces that served more directly in terms of imagery. Well, because I use these two little people because I like the modesty of the, of the kind of... The, some guy was turning these out with like this, you know, and I love that, and I knew that when I blew it up, enlarged it, that there will be drama that isn't in the smaller pieces because they're not necessarily heroic now. They're charming. This, I wanted something not so charming. There's an act of translation that occurs in all right. this work we've been looking at, but particularly I'm interested in, uh, and you've done that in other works, the works from the Met, that you, there's this great um, transfer of scale from something that's very small to very large. And I'm interested in how you get that idea. How do you know that that can work? What could tell because, you? Well, one thing is I've seen what pointing up can do. It can be very unpleasant. I've, I, I, I've seen Miro's that were pointed up in Carrara, for instance, or the sculptor, uh, the British sculptor Barry Flanagan. Before he made the rabbits, he made he, certain abstract pieces that were pointed up. The Miro's and the Barry Flanagan's I thought were dead. And they're dead because nobody touches them after it's pointed up. When, you, when I give a maquette like this, let's say of Pinocchio, and I give it to Dylan Farnham, who is the guy in Walla Walla who scans these things for me, I know that every fingerprint on the face, every way I make a little bit of the nose and I pinch it like that with clay or something, if it's not a clay, it's, when it's blown up, it's a tumor. It's absolutely horrible. So it has to be dealt with when it's blown up. And you must keep, you got to keep messing with it and, and, and um, correcting. It's my method is correcting. It's the same method I have in drawing. I put, a, I put, I, I make a head, let's say, I take it out. I make another head. I always felt that if I could do it once, I could do it again. I'm not worried about, I'm going to lose it. I don't think anything's that precious. And it's the same thing with this. I mean, I, I take it out, and if I've taken too much away, well, then we, we glue a big block of wood to where I took it away. Then we re-carve it. I work with a wonderful carver called Jason Treffery, and he, he, he's able to set that in there. I say, cut it off here, cut it off, say, in her butt, like half of it, you know, because it wasn't right. And, he, and then he'll set the block in, and then we'll go back, both of us, and carve it and sand it, and it's continual correcting. And that's the way it's done. Mine is a kind of collage method. Well, let's talk a little bit about the collage of the room, because the whole room upstairs, as I began this discussion saying, is, I think, this very unique whole world. You go in there and there's, there are very strange um, juxtapositions of scale. At one time you can feel almost claustrophobic that everything is very close to you, then all of a sudden the room seems very large. Now talk a little bit about you built a room in, in Walla Walla, the same dimensions, and you ultimately ended up deciding that you needed not two figures based on these, but four, and you made 
changes, slight changes. Well, yeah, but it them. was before that something else changed. I built the room in Walla Walla exactly to these measurements. But I'm a little careless, so I forgot about the molding, and I forgot about this screwball floor that's up there. And so I just did that. So I had the big head in there, and I had these two figures. But at the same time, and I had talked to the people here about what I was going to do, and they kept saying, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I said, I got this idea for a head, this, and then I'm going to line the walls, I said, with photographs that have to do with it, maybe of the sculpture itself, or drawings, or this sort of thing. And then one day, you see, one of the ways I write poems is, and you know, you know this, but the audience doesn't necessarily, I'm dyslexic, and I have a problem sitting down at a computer or a typewriter or with a little book, I have a problem. I've got to see the work big. So I always put big pieces of paper on the wall and make uh, uh, write on the wall like that on the paper, and then I correct it with gesso I'll, I'll, or a bin, uh, a stopping out fluid. I'll, 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 I'll correct that way and then change and change and change. So one day when I'm thinking about this piece and we've built the room and things, I put these 10 sheets of paper up and I made this poem in 10 stanzas. Now, the poem happens a little bit to relate to the, what I'm thinking of, a little bit to relate to the thing I took it from, but it also relates to a, a zillion other things that I was thinking about that day and those weeks I was making the poem. And I thought, you know, an artist has the right to say, this works. You know, I don't have to explain that this is not specifically this or not specifically that. And I just went ahead with that, and I, it, I just invented it that way. That was the way it was. That's the way it happened. And then I started to write on the wall, see how I could get, how big it would be, where are we going to put the stanzas, how's it going to be. But I, I got bored with it a little bit because I knew I was going to have to do it down here, and I wanted to keep it fresh. So I only did like a corner on two, like that, and saw how it worked with the sculpture. And then the Getty sent a film team to start making this film. And because they were there, I was able to see things that I hadn't seen before. And I realized I needed more, more pieces in the room. So we went back to the scans, and I showed Dylan Farnham on a paper, he printed it out for me, what, what the two of the sculptures upstairs looked like. And then I changed them, changed the angle. I made her bend it, bend it, not anatomically correct, back more. I, I made her head more upright so that they were variations on the theme. That's the way I made it. And when I made those, in the beginning, let me also say that when I had the two wood figures, I, I wanted, I had this idea, this is a great chance to paint the sculpture like it was done in Greece, with bright colors. And, because uh, that's the way the sculpture was. And with these bright primary colors, I said, I, you know, I'm going to be true to the whole thing. This is the Getty Villa, this is going to be great. It was horrible what I made. And I mean, it was glaring and cheesy looking. So I had this idea, because it was, the wood was cracking anyway. It was checking. It was very green, red oak. So I said, let's sandblast it. At the foundry, we have all these possibilities of doing things. So we sandblasted it. And what came out was the wood again and little hints of color, like it's a little corny, but that's the way sculpt Greek sculpture looks. You can find traces of the color. And I liked that very much. It was a tipping of the hat to the antique. Well, the one element that, of course, we've not talked about is probably the most prominent one, I think, when people first see the room, which is... Dine's the, head? The <laughs> elephant in the room, yeah. so to speak. And in what case, did, in what stage did you decide to, to put that definitive marking in the room? Um, in the beginning, when we were down here scanning these, Dylan also scanned my head. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And I, because I'm not too good at these things, 
um, accurately, accurate dimensions. I made it so we couldn't get it in the room. <laughs> so that's why it's able to look so enormous and claustrophobic because we had to bring it in in half and patch it. Um, and I'm really proud of that. <laughs> well, could, I think we have one more slide. And this is actually a detail. This is not a, you're not seeing the whole painting, but this is a detail from a 1969 painting done when Jim Dine was living in London. And it, when you see the whole painting, the painting is in the, the National Gallery in Washington. When you see the whole painting, it's quite large. It's almost the size of this. It's 16 screen. feet. 16 feet. It's a, it's a list or a, a painting of, I don't know if it's every person you could remember, but it seems like. No, it, it is. It, I, I, I thought to myself one day, it was a dream I had. I said, I'm going to make a drawing. I called it the name painting, but in fact, it's a drawing. It's charcoal on canvas. That's all. And I, I said, I was in London, and I tacked up a piece of canvas 16 feet long on the wall, I stapled to the wall, and I said, I'm going to make a list of everybody I ever knew. <laughs> and so I started, and I got to 1963. Well, this was in 69. That what's fascinating about the piece is that it goes from left to right in chronological order. So the Left side is family members and boyhood friends and other people from that era. And then all of a sudden, you start to see people like Red Grooms and Alan Capro. <laughs> yeah. And you say, well, dying life, to New York. Life goes on. you know. <laughs> but I also realized, as I made it, that it was a way of drawing. And that it was a way of using the pedimento of memory, of... of putting something down, rubbing it with my hands, making that recede, bring forward more important people at the time. I'm very fickle. So, who, you know, I didn't like this person. They were out. You know, I, I rubbed it out, but I left it, and I brought it forward. So what, you don't really get too much sense of that here because when you see the whole thing, it's really a landscape drawing. But I also, all my life, because I'm left-handed, and I come from, I'm 73, so in, let's say, 1941, in grade school, some son of a bitch taught, was teaching me penmanship and cracking me across the fingers because I smeared because I'm left-handed. I'm going this way, you know, and it's, you had to dip in the ink well, and this primitive, but that's Cincinnati. And, um, but it, it, I love the smears. That's what they couldn't understand. I, they were doing me a favor. They po made me, pointed out like how beautiful process can be and what the hand can do. And um, I've all my life been involved in typography and calligraphy. And that segues into how I did this upstairs. But in between is all the poems I've written on the walls. Uh, other places to make poems. Or I, in the, about 1998 till 2000, I went down to Washington, D.C., to work with a man who had a digital camera, beautiful camera with a digital back. It was a, 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 a four by five camera. And I built, in, I built in the small room, I built installations that I photographed. And I wrote poems in the installations and corrected and got into my handwriting again, you know? And this is, a, this is all the result of it. This upstairs is the result of it. The way I did this was I had written it on the walls in this long piece of paper, and I took it to Europe because I made a little book of it, a facsimile of it. Um, with the long paper. And then we got here, and we had it all written out. So I said, this is what we got to do. We, this is, I said this to my wife and the two guys working with me, uh, Jason Treffrey and Dylan Farnham. I said, we got to, you take a stanza, I'll take a stanza. You know, four of us would make 10 stanzas. Just 
don't try to duplicate my handwriting, you can't, but try to in another kind of way, you know. And then we kept, I kept going and correcting and on the ladder, up and down, and changing it to make it mine. And by doing that, I also, it was a way to edit the poem and to sometimes change the meaning of certain lines, but also for me to be able to, I splash water on the wall, I, I use my hand on the wall, I used rags to take away. Um, I used different kinds of charcoal that are more brown or more black. And, and it was like this. It was always layering, layering, layering. So in the end, and also the color I got seemed to work with the molding, which really surprised me. You know. So now, folks, I've told you everything. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more to say. Well, we... Um... <laughs> Jim Dine did a, is involved in a project recently, it's um, almost finished, called Hot Dream 52 Books, in which he did a book a week for one year. And he's done many, many books, many artist books, books of poetry, um, some in the 1960s, some more recently. And I thought we could switch gears here, maybe turn off the slides, that's our last slide. And you have said recently in an interview, you, you mentioned some contemporary poets who were important to you. And if you agree, I brought some of their poems and I thought we could, I, we could read them, the short poems. And yeah, talk if about we could do it short and, and then talk we could about, talk about it. Your, yeah. We end up talking about your poem. You know, I don't mean to embarrass him, but Vincent has made a f fabulous magazine called Vanitas which is about four issues now, right? right. And uh, some of the, much of the writing in it is really wonderful. You, um, it's like, it's this, oops, it's this. Well, this was the yeah. first, first copy, I think, first issue. But um, Vincent and I, meet, I met because he wrote a review of a show I had at the Guggenheim Museum of my work from the 60s. I think that's how we met, isn't it? That is, yeah. Yeah, and um, we really enjoy talking about poetry. So this will be like a little snippet of one of those chats. But a real snippet. A real snippet. Yeah. Well, one of the poets that I know you had a very close relationship with was Robert Creeley, and he's dedicated a couple of poems to you. This is from a poem called In London, um, when you were living in London. It's, in, it's, it's actually from a book he wrote called The Day Book, so it's, like, it's, it's a little bit like notations in a journal. It starts like this, in London, homage to Bly and Lorca, I'm going home to Boston by God, signs, red, exit, 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 exit. Cards, question, where do you get a pencil? Answer, for Jim Dine, most common, simple address, words, everything in one clear call to me. And then it, it mentions another poet, Ted Berrigan, who, with whom you did your first reading in London. It says, Ted is ready, the bell rings. And then, and then later, 12.30, Berrigan sleeps on. I was wondering if you could tell how you met Berrigan in London. I don't know if that was your first meeting with him, but he did. Show no, it was up at my first doorway. meeting. With him. It was my first meeting with him. He was a, a wonderful New York poet. Um, I guess almost my age, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, had he lived, I guess he'd be about seventy-one. And um, he, I was living in London, and he, the doorbell rang, and this guy is standing there with a seaman's bag over his. Knee. He said, "Hi, Jim. I'm Ted Berrigan." I said, "Hi, Ted." I mean, I was amazed. This is a famous guy, I thought. This is a guy I really revered. He said, can I stay here? <laughs> I said, I, I guess so. So he spent the summer with my family and I and, and the nanny. And um, he, um, he, he really, really uh, taught me a lot. I mean, we read a lot together. And uh, we spoke about poetry. And... Um, you know, in the art world, in the painting, sculpture world, it's not as 
I've never found it as close as in the poetry world because poets, first place, it's about language and they're speaking, but also, and I'm not saying big egos aren't involved, but big dollars aren't involved. So it's, I think, easier to meet. Um, so I've, uh, poets like, like Berrigan and his, his friend Ron Padgett and Creeley, who was really a giant, uh, really have informed my use of the language. Um, and also, and they've done, interestingly enough, they, I never thought of them as anybody who really knew what I was making visually, necessarily, because they were always talking about the language. And they just accepted that I was this artist. It was great that I was this artist. Said, That's great, you're this artist. But what more important was, how do you use this? What, what do you say? The things Berrigan said were so original, I thought. And uh, I felt the same way about O'Hara. Frank O'Hara was um, a gener uh, Creeley's generation. And um, a poet who was friends with many, many painters of his generation and uh, wrote poems, I think, influenced by abstract expressionism. Well, we were talking today yeah. about uh, Orange's Sardines, which I just passed at the Hammer Museum. Yeah. And his, that famous poem of his about Michael Goldberg's painting Sardines and how he saw the word sardines in it and he kept coming back to see it over time and then eventually Sardines wasn't there anymore. He said, what happened to sardines? He said, it was too much. All that was left was letters. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, 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 I always buy lunch poems. It's a, it's a series put out, it's a book put out by Ferlinghetti at City Lights in San Francisco. But I, I buy it wherever I am just to keep it going. And, um, but because it, it always thrills me. And uh, he wrote a poem called Naphtha. He said, ah, Jean Dubuffet, when you think of him doing his military service in the Eiffel Tower as a meteorologist in 1922, you know how wonderful the 20th century can be. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was a great guy. <laughs> well, speaking of Ted Berrigan's language, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, here's a poem, a short poem by Berrigan, maybe written in London, called Wake Up. Jim Dine's toothbrush eases two pills activity under the clear blue sky. Girl for someone else in white walk by. It means sober up, kick the brunette out of bed, going out to earn your pay. It means out, bells ring, squirrel serve a nut, daylight fade, fly resting on your shoulder blades for hours. You've been sleeping, taking it easy, Neon doesn't like that. Having come your way, giving you a free buzz, not to take your breath away, just tightening everything up a little. Legs pump, head wobble, tongue loll, fingers jump. Drink, eat, flirt, sing, speak. Nighttime ruffles the down along your cheek. And I wanted to read that because it reminded me of some of your early poems, and we've been collecting your poems. I've been thinking about them a lot. I was wondering if this poem, well, first of all, do you, when did you start writing the poems that ended up in the book Welcome Home Lovebirds that you published? I started to, I started to write poems when I was, um, I taught at Cornell University in 65, 66, or 66, 67, and I was very lonesome. And um, so I started to make poems. I started to make poems, and I've been involved with poems all my life because of my dyslexia. I couldn't read books. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't concentrate. But poems shortened the process because they're shorter. And I could get into them. I could pick up a book in a bookstore, and I'd just open the page and do it. So I thought, I can do this. I, can, I think I can do this, you know. And I always thought, and I always think, that my titles, for instance, of paintings or sculpture, 
are an object, just like I think all words are objects. It's like red or blue. So that there's almost no difference from my poetry and what I do visually, because the poetry is visual. It's a, an object. Were you, <clears throat> when you started to write, were you, I mean, a lot of the poets of that era, of Creeley's era, such as Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, um, were very anti-T.S. Eliot. It was almost like the boogeyman that they could react against right. to find something new. And among others, William Carlos Williams was one example of how to use an American vernacular. Was he somebody that... He was always my hero. You know, and he was my hero, but at the same time, he said, I didn't have the prejudices that those guys had. Because at first place, I wasn't a poet. I never thought of myself as that. So I was very involved with Dylan Thomas, really involved with him, too, because of the records, the series called Cadman, these women who had recorded him under Milkwood and um, his collected poems. But I was just always involved with poems. I, I, since I was a kid, and also goes back to the thing of singing. I loved lyrics of songs. Did you talk for a minute about Robert Creeley and, and what your, you, you did do a number of collaborations with Creeley and also I think had a deep, if I may use that word again, um, relationship with him. What, what did he mean to you as a poet and as a friend? He, he, well, I, I met him at, when I was at Cornell. He was teaching at Buffalo and um, came down to see a friend. We met, we talked, and we... He was the most, um, he was the most uh, outsider person I'd ever met and um, quite dangerous to other people and to himself. And his unhappiness, his psychic unhappiness, and his sense of disaffection from the world was palpable. But on the other hand, he was a hugely cultured man and who had read everything and who spoke in a very original way. So I was charmed by that. And he always was loyal to me and at times of crisis could speak to me in a way that almost no one could. Also, I thought he was, and I do think he is, a great artist. And he showed me a way of composing, for instance. How one can compose with the voice. Um, do you There's think a poem was... here that he dedicated to you that I'd like to read. If oh, you, fine. If it's OK. Yeah. Um, this is called Scholar's Rocks for Jim Dine, and I wanted to read it. I mean, it's a beautiful poem, but I think that it's also interesting because there are a number of moments in this poem in which he is seems to be describing what Jim Dine does as an artist in his own words. Scholar's Rocks for Jim Dine. What has been long pondered become encrusted, grown into itself, colored by world, by echoed independence from world, by all that it wasn't. What had been thought? What had been felt? What was it? As in a forest, as if, as if, one had come to, as in a forest, to a wall of the heart, a wall of the heart, glass, enclosing, including, stuck into these insistent things, ghosts of another wall, childhoods, all hung in order, elegant and particular, hands, handed, hand tools. What happens when the house is at last quiet and the lights lowered go finally out? Then is it all silent? Are the echoes still, the reflections faded, the places left alone? As fingers round a stick, as a pen's held, a thumb can help grip. So a wrench's extension, a hammer's force, meticulous cutting clippers, hatchet's sharpened edge, one could not cut without. 
I love the long wrench whose gears permit attention, twixt objects fixed tight between its iron teeth. So locked, one can twist, and so the object turns, loosens, at last comes out. This is life's bliss. Which one did it? Do you recognize the culprit? Is your own heart full? Sometimes it's like looking at orphans, and no one will come. No one seems to want them. There's a patience which seems awful, inhuman to be left, to have no place on earth. The heart alone holds them. Minds made them. Seeing's believing, beyond eyes, beyond the edges of things. The face of what's out there is an adamant skin. One touches it, feels it, coming, going, through the looking glass, leaving marks, making a trail for the way back. One writes on the surface, sensing all that's under it, oceans of a common history, things of the past. Well, thanks, Vincent. I'm I'm done here now. You're done. Yeah. You don't want to talk about your poem at all. No, no. Okay. I don't have any more to say. I've um, it's been a fabulous experience. This whole thing, and I simply have nothing more to say. <laughs> if those of you that haven't seen upstairs, take a look. Um, let's have a drink. You know, let's uh, enough.